wrong and it got it right anyway. My computers are smart. All right, so let's see, I should be able to mute all these people. All right. And uh, okay. So the first thing should be the schedule, which is a little bit notable this time because there are guest speakers coming. Well, I'm not sure in this class, but in some of them. Let's see if I can get the stupid internet to move. Looks like I can't. Well, that, okay. Nope. Neat. Well, that's the staff network, which seems completely useless. Okay, let's try the guest network. See if that's any better. Neat. Okay, good, good. I was afraid that some evil person might have hacked me, but apparently not. All right, so that's good. I'm back to the network what it complains about, but it works. So we are down here. Oh, yeah, we had a guest last week. So no more guests planned for this class. So today is uh, Project 15 due, and then we're going to go on to elliptic curves. But there are a lot of guests coming in other classes. On Wednesday, tomorrow, is Abdullah Joseph, and he is hiring in Germany. And here's a relocation bonus for people willing to move to Germany. So he'll talk about that, among other things, along, along with Android malware tomorrow. Then another purple competition, which will be Splunk at 1 p.m., not 11, this Saturday. And then a couple of talks next week. Monday is Penguin, the Linux distribution intended to run on Windows. And Wednesday is uh, getting in information security talk from this fellow, Iman Elswa. And then a job fair. Also on Monday, many, many things coming up. This tends to happen at the end of the semester here. So uh, let's see if there's anything fun in the news. I just saw Elizabeth Warren's making 400 grand at Harvard. I should quit. Anyway, um, so Elon Musk says he's going to have thousands of completely autonomous taxis on the road next year. Everyone is laughing at him. He said this kind of thing before. Um, he also said he's going to go to Mars and such. Um, this one is kind of unbelievable. Um, and this is probably worth looking at. This one's pretty entertaining. All right. And All right, let's take a look at these. So there's the self-driving car, which is probably nonsense. This one is a surprising one. So when they chalk your car tire like this, they have declared that that is an unconstitutional search because putting a mark on the car to find out how long you've been there amounts to retrieving information from a private object without probable cause. That is pretty interesting. That's similar to the, uh, that reminds me of the CFAA, where right-clicking on a website and viewing source and noticing that they have an old version of something amounts to an illegal search, retrieving information from a server without authorization. It's a similar issue. Anyway, we'll see if that holds up. Uh, so I've been trying to do AV evasion for another class, and it's very hard. Um, almost every time there's anything published about how to evade antivirus, the antivirus people update their stuff and it quits working. But here's a new trick I just came across, which is pretty twisted and insane and I like it, what you do is you install another antivirus. And when you put on the new antivirus, it kills off the old one. And of course, you put on a lousy one. That's a simple way to solve the problem. Anyway, so, uh, we'll see how well that works. I might try that one. Anyway, uh, there's a lot of other tricks here for antivirus bypass, but uh, none of them work that well. I'm thinking the way to do it right is to uh, just compile your own code with Visual Studio and make your own tools. Anyway. Um, they make this big deal out of detecting a new way to improve network security, but it didn't sound all that new to me. Um, what they're doing is using network intrusion detection systems like Splunk, and um, what they're talking about is just a way of compressing the data to more efficiently send data to your central receiver. And what they're doing is noticing that if an attack happens, the first few packets contain all the information, and then there's a thousand more alerts 
as the attack proceeds doing the same thing over and over. So just sending the first few is all you need to detect it, and that would save you a lot of time. Uh, this is really nothing that new. I know um, uh, Juniper firewalls have been doing this all along. When I went to the Juniper training class, they said this is how their firewall moves data at line speed. It only checks the first packet for each flow, and if that meets the approval of the firewall, it just lets all the rest follow without inspecting them again to keep it going fast. And that's also what flow routers do, which would make the internet supposedly 10 or 100 times faster if everyone switched to them, that instead of looking up every IP address that comes through in a giant table, it just looks up the first one and then assigns it a flow label and all the rest just follow the first one like ants, which would save a whole lot of processing time at every hop. But nobody has upgraded to that yet. It's just a prototype. So here's a bug. Um, this, this is an interesting vulnerability disclosure story. So Shopify had an API flaw and they had a bug bounty. So this guy um, found it by a researcher. And then what he did was um, uh, it has eight, 800,000 merchants and 175 companies. So he set up a new store and checked to see if it was vulnerable. So then he performed a mass check on all existing stores and found ones that were vulnerable. Um, and then he found a data set and tested them all, found a list of vulnerable stores, and then downloaded a whole bunch of data from each of them. Um, he tested on 800,000 merchant stores, 8,700 were vulnerable. He was able to obtain tails and traffic data and so on. Then he figured out what happened, caused it, and sent the findings to Spotify. And Spotify said, you went way beyond the limits of the bug bounty. You weren't allowed to do all this nonsense and we're not gonna pay you because you violated the policy. There was a similar case about six years ago when a guy found a vulnerability in Facebook and said, I can post on anybody's wall and sent them an incoherent, angry email that no one could understand, so they didn't answer. Then he sent them another one, and they didn't answer. So then he hacked Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook page and put something on Mark's wall. And then they said, well, now you violated the terms of, sir, of the bug bounty, so we're not going to pay you. And he was all upset. But then they published his emails, and I couldn't understand a word of them either. So this is... Anyway, quite common that, that, that hackers get carried away and hack everything and then expect you to say thank you. And it usually doesn't work out that way. Anyway, um, let's see if there's anything else. I got a minute or two here. Uh, this one I mentioned in another class, but it's very interesting. This is what's happening with the Boeing. A very good read about why the Boeing is unsafe. And the short answer is because they made the engine much bigger, so they had to move it up higher on the wing, so it deep stabilized the whole plane. And in order to sell the product, they had to pretend that this new 737 MAX is the same as the old 737, so pilots don't need any more additional training to drive it. That is the main reason people buy it, and that is manifestly not true. The new product is so much harder to drive that they really should give it a different number and call it a different training, but if they did that, nobody would buy it because everybody doesn't want to retrain all their pilots and get it reapproved. So uh, that's his analysis of why the thing is defective and crashing. Anyway, Greg and I can get going here. Let's see, we should have some people online if I could figure out how to operate my computer. Okay, I've got a few online and one hardcore person here. So let's talk about Diffie-Hellman. All right, so Diffie-Hellman is uh, the original discovery that reinvented a top secret military technique, which the NSA had been using supposedly for 20 years and kept secret, and the problem is Although they can outlaw leaking, they cannot outlaw being smart. And sooner or later, a mathematician on the outside will reinvent whatever you are hiding. And that's what happened. In 1976, Diffie and Hellman reinvented this technique. And the goal here is to distribute a secret without sending anything over the network that can be used to find the secret. That's public key distribution. This is the heart of public key encryption and signatures. So all this does is find a way to agree on a shared secret without sending that secret over the network. Then you can take the secret and turn it into symmetric key and use symmetric encryption like AES or triple DES or anything you like and have a secure channel. So this uses the very simple group, Z star P. When we did RSA, we used Z star N, where N was the product of two primes, and that had a lot of strange consequences, like the uh, five function was required to find out how many of those numbers were available. But if you were to have a prime number as the modulus, then it's very simple. The group is all the numbers from one up to the P minus one. That's it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know any, I never studied any real mathematical group theory out in, in the context of cryptography. But I think this is a standard notation for us. 
but I'm only guessing. It's a good question, but I don't know the answer. Anyway, so Diffie-Hellman, so now you're going to choose two random, so you just choose two random elements, which are just any number from one to P minus one, and those A and B are your secrets. Now, they, they agree on a number G, which is not secret, and publish it. And now, um, Alice takes G, calculates G to the A and sends it over the network, and Bob takes G to the B and sends it over the network, and those are not secret. Those are public, but the A and B are secret. So now, Alice takes the number she gets to the A, and Bob takes the number he gets to the B, and they both have now got G to the AB. So they've created a number that they both agree on, but the numbers they've sent over the network are very distantly related to those numbers in a way that it's almost impossible to discover it. That's the plan. So Alice takes G to the A mod P, sends it to Bob, and so they're both going to get G to the AB mod P. That is the shared secret. Yeah. They just pick a G and publish it openly. It's not secret. So we know G. We know G to the power of A. Right. And we know G to the power of B. Why is it possible? Oh, because are they, oh, wait, no. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. You know G, and you know G to the A, and you know G to the B. But you can't find A or B because that's the, um, the, the uh, discrete logarithm problem. If you know G to the A, find A. That is essentially impossible. That's the hard problem on which it's all based that you cannot reverse G to the A. This is the same thing was true of RSA. This, that's the discrete logarithm problem. If you know G to the A, find A, that is essentially impossible. There is no fast way to do it. And that, that, that's hard. That's hard factoring of prime numbers. That's a fundamental hard problem. You know a number, remember how it's modulus. G to the A has wrapped around a very large number of times and turned into an essentially random number. So the only way to figure out what A creates G to the A is to just try every A up to some huge number on the order of P. No, it is modulus. Modulus P. It's all modulus P. All right, so we're not actually saying G to the A, we're saying G to the A modulus P. Oh, yes, everything is mod P, yeah. And if it wasn't mod P, then it would not be that hard. You're right. Anyway, so that's the game. So now you have, now one thing that's a little dirty trick is you now have a shared secret, but that shared secret is essentially a random number from one to P. And that's not really what you want for key. You need to use a key derivation function because the um, P is probably not two to the N minus one. And that means not all the bits have an equal chance of being zero and one in P. So you should run it through a hash function or something to scramble it up first. And that's what a key derivation function is. Uh, the most common key derivation function is PBKDF2, which is the same thing you use to hash passwords on Linux systems. It's just many rounds of SHA-512 or something like that, plus a random uh, nonce added to it before you start hashing. So it turns out that you can't just use any value of P and G um, because remember when we did Pollard's row, if you just hash things over and over again, you might get a circle where it just goes, does not explore all possible values. It just goes around a small loop of values. And there's a possibility that as you take G to the A and then you say G to the one, G to the two, G to the three, the same thing will happen. You'll end up in a small loop of values instead of really exploring all the values from one to P minus one. So you want to choose a prime number that does not have any small loops. And that turns out the way to do that is that for P to be prime and also P minus one over two to be prime. If both of those are prime, then there are going to be no small loops, which I don't think is intuitively obvious, at least not to me, but that's the rule. Uh, so this is pretty horrible because remember when we talked about RSA, how you find prime numbers. You just take random numbers and then you test to see if they're prime, which takes 100 calculations. Uh, for a good algorithm, maybe four or five calculations for each one. And then you keep guessing until you find a prime number. And it will probably take hundreds of guesses to find a prime number. Now, after you're done with that, you have to try another test on each one to see if it's a safe prime. And that turns out to be very expensive. Um, it turns out it makes it a thousand times slower than finding prime numbers in the first place. And so remember the generating the RSA key was the slowest operation at RSA. But if you use OpenSSL, this happens in 0.17 seconds. But if you generate a Diffie-Hellman key, it takes 154 seconds, a thousand times longer. So these keys are expensive to generate. Um, but uh, once you've made one, you can use it. I don't know if you can keep using it over and over for different exchanges. I would think you could. Anyway, so, so here's the problem. You have the public value G to the A, and the secret value is A, and therefore recovering A from G to the A is the discrete logarithm problem. And that is essentially impossible. Nobody's found a fast way to do it. 
So that's the problem that has to be hard. However, that is the pure mathematical discrete logarithm problem, and it turns out that Diffie Hellman requires more security than just that problem being hard. If that problem was easy, the whole thing would fall down. But what the real situation is this the bad guy in the middle has g to the a and g to the b. So they, and if they could find either A or B, they'd be compromised in the system. So it's possible you might imagine that knowing both of those numbers would help them. That's the, uh, the computational Diffie-Hellman problem. If they know G and they know G to the A and they know G to the B, can they find either A or B? And, it, and no one really knows how hard that problem is. It is assumed to be comparably hard to the DLP, but that is not proven. Now, the technique that is best here is the same as RSA. It's the number sieve, and RSA is the general number sieve. That is the way to do it, the fastest known technique, and it's not very fast. So if you use a 2048-bit prime, you get 90 bits of security, which is considered unbreakable for practical terms. Um, so the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem is what you'd really like, which means that if the, um, the attacker investigates all the public data, they can't determine anything about the key, not even part of the key, not even the first few bits of the key. That's what you really would like, because if they could determine anything about the key, then that would make it faster to crack the problem, and you don't want that. So that's, you know, that's why I say you want it to be completely random, so that the connection between what you can observe and the secret you're trying to find appears totally random. There are no patterns in the public data that you can use to deduce the key. Remember, we talked about this for the uh, RC4 stream protocol. The fact that it has a tiny chance of being 127 more often than it should is enough to ruin everything. Any failure to be completely random could be exploited to leak out information. So we should talk about what makes a key agreement protocol secure. So in general, here's what you want for a key agreement protocol. Here's an example of a bad one, the one used by 3G and 4G, authenticated key agreement. This uses only symmetric key operations, doesn't have any public key. So you have a shared secret K, which is on the SIM card on the right and on the operator on the left. And now the operator picks a random value R and then calculates two public values to send to the other side. And the other side does a combination and sends it back. And so you end up agreeing on a temporary session key based on the shared secret key and on a random number that was picked by the operator. So this means that there's a shared secret, which of course if stolen ruins everything, and there's a random number that's totally controlled by one party that determines what's used. Uh, this of course would make sense to telephony because in the telephone system, the operator is the phone company and they want to retain control over everything and the SIM card is the, is the customer with a phone that the phone company regards themselves as still possessing and really controlling to a large extent and they would naturally gravitate towards a system where they control everything and the phone is kind of a dumb drone to just do what it's told. Um, anyway, this is subject to replay attacks. If I capture the public information going by and just replay it, then I can impersonate the telco at a future case. So to prevent this, you're going to have to make sure that R is not reused. If I get to steal K, then I can do everything. I pour a man in the middle attacks and impersonate either party. I could even record communications and steal K later and then go back and take all the captured R's and decrypt all the old data, which is, of course, what the NSA is doing in Utah, archiving all the data on the internet and the telephone network for years, hoping that later they will steal the keys and be able to decrypt it. And that is true for protocols like this and TLS 1.0, and I think also TLS 1.1, that don't have forward secrecy. They'll be able to decrypt old data later if they ever get the key. So here are the models that determine how strong a, a, a key exchange system is. The weakest attack is an eavesdropper. where All they do is sit in the middle like the black hat character in a previous slide, and all they do is record the public data going by, and they're also in the middle so they can intercept and alter data. So the question is, can they do anything important there? And in order to make it secure against an eavesdropper, you just have to make it so none of the public data gives you anything about the shared secret, which is, of course, the whole point of this. If the DLP and the related DLP problems are really hard, then you have that in Diffie-Hellman, that the public data is not reversible to get the private data. A data leak is where you suppose they get the session key and all the temporary secrets, but not the long-term secret K. And a breach is where the attacker learns the long-term secret K. Now that means there's no way to stop them from compromising the immediate session at the time they stole K, but it's possible for a protocol with forward secrecy to mean that even if they do a total breach, they're not gonna be able to get the data from previous sessions. 
So here's your security goals. Authentication means you know who you're talking to in some secure way, and therefore you can stop a man in the middle attack because if someone tries to impersonate the person in the middle, they will not be able to prove, they won't be able to pass your authentication test. Um, key control means neither party can control the final secret. If one party is able to control the secret, then they can manipulate it. They might be able to manipulate it into unsafe ranges and be able to predict it and so on. Um, the 3G, 4G protocol, as I mentioned, does not have this property. The telco completely determines the random number. The customer does not have an equal input into this. And that means, of course, that a compromise of the telco would be more severe than a compromise of the client. So forward secrecy, you mentioned forward secrecy means you have somehow a different session key for every time, and even compromising everything about a later session does not give you enough information to break the previous sessions. And 3G and 4G don't provide that either. Uh, I probably, it might not even be legal for them to provide it. I don't suppose that was a consideration, but in America, there's really stiff laws about wiretaps. So the telephone company is really not allowed to encrypt things with an encryption they can't get into. Well, I don't know if it's illegal for them to reuse keys. The only thing the law says is they have to assist law enforcement. So if they come with a wiretap order, they have to have some way to wiretap. I don't think they're required to give them past records. I meant like in terms of forward secrecy. Yeah, I don't think forward secrecy is specifically illegal, but I, if I was a telco, I would check with my lawyers first and read Kalia carefully. <laughs> yes. Yes, if you reused keys. And so that's an option. Yeah, you're right. And that, by the way, is similar to the secure of key escrow. Key escrow is for, taken so seriously about a decade or two ago that Microsoft built it into their software. Microsoft operating systems have the ability to automatically upload the keys to remote server because they thought that around, I think, 2003 or so, they really thought the government was going to require you to send all the keys to the government. That's something that uh, has come up many times. It hasn't passed in America. But I think it has passed in the United Arab Emirates and other countries. All the keys have to go to the government. Anyway, so uh, here's another consideration, of course, is performance. Um, you'd like to know how many messages are exchanged because the latency from end to end is usually your main time cost. And then you'd like to know how much CPU time it takes. That might also be expensive. Uh, if you can save CPU time, if you can have pre-computation, and this apparently is what happens with the um, 3G and 4G standards. The telco pre-computes a bunch of them, so they've got it all ready to go when a call comes in. All right, and that's the game. So the 3G and 4G system is quite efficient. Two exchanges of only a few hundred bits each, they don't even have to be in sequence, and then you're ready to go. So that would be, I think, you know, their goal, of course, remember the original telephone network never encrypted anything. You just sent plain text analog data over copper wires. So I don't know why the telco telephone company would feel any need to really have great encryption on their stuff. They're not obligated to have any encryption at all. So I'm sure they tried to pick something that's just fast and cheap to implement. Um, and it seems like it's reasonably strong, but they wouldn't feel a need for any advanced cryptography, I think. All right. So here's some Diffie-Hellman protocols. This is the original simple one, anonymous Diffie-Hellman where all that happens is what we talked about. Alice picks a little a, calculates big A, which is G to the A mod P, and sends it over. Bob does the same thing with B. So the only thing sent over the network is G to the A and G to the B, and they have both agreed on G, which has been transmitted in some public way. And now they have agreed on a shared secret. The problem with this is there's no authentication at all. That's why it's anonymous. Neither of them in any way proved that they were genuine. So Eve in the middle can totally take over. All she has to do is when Alice sends A, she keeps A, but doesn't send it forward and sends another random secret to Bob. This is exactly what Burt does for TLS. They send a fake secret to Bob, or a fake public key for a private key that the attacker in the middle has. So Bob encrypts stuff, but they're actually encrypting it to Eve. And then they send a different fake number to Alice. And now Alice thinks she's encrypting stuff to Bob, but she's really encrypting stuff to Eve. And Eve is in the middle and can read and alter everything. This is fine, but there is a way to detect it, of course. Alice and Bob have not actually agreed on a key here. If Alice and Bob were to compare their shared secret keys, they would discover they're not actually using the same shared secret. But the original protocol does not have any step that does that, so they both blissfully can use their system, imagining it as safe when it's totally intercepted by the man in the middle. So authenticated, Diffie-Hellman uses some kind of signature so they sign the message here, 
with a private key. And Alice has a private key and a Bob is public key. So Alice can sign things with her private key and Bob can verify them with Alice's public key. Bob can sign things with his private key and Alice can verify it with Bob's public key. So now the attacker in the middle cannot lie and get away with it because they don't have the private keys and they cannot intercept, decrypt, or, or modify the messages. All they can do is view the encrypted messages and not be able to open them, which is what you want. All right. So uh, this stops eavesdroppers. If all Alice can do, if all the attacker Eve can do is listen to the encrypted traffic on the unsecured channel, then they get encrypted stuff without the key and they can't get in. That's the idea. Um, all right, a replay attack. Eve can record and replay previous values, replay a previous session in its entirety. Um, so you would have to add a step of key confirmation to prevent this, where they have a sort of challenge nonce, and that's what we have here. They use a complicated thing with a signature, but you could just use a challenge response where they send you some random thing and say, okay, encrypt this with your private key and send it back to prove that you really have the private key. And that's essentially what this does. All right. And then there's the MQV system. This was simple and beautiful and supposedly uh, uh, more secure than anything. It can't be approved by the NSA in 1998, but in fact, almost never used. Um, so here what you do is you have X and Y are long-term private keys, and, and you have long-term public keys, and you add them to the A and the B, and the end result is now you're secure against essentially all these attacks. This is the most secure system. Um, so the data leak doesn't work because there are long-term private keys. So even if you get the ephemeral keys, the temporary keys for one session, you're no good because there are private keys you don't have. If you have a total breach, previous sessions are still safe. This has forward secrecy. Um, there is a attack that can compromise one old session given some more data that's a little complicated, but you can mitigate it with a key confirmation step. Um, but this thing was never used. It was encumbered by patents, and it turned out to be complicated to program, and people found it a lot of, too much bother, and they decided that the intermediate one, authenticated Diffie-Hellman, was almost as good and a lot simpler. And that became the standard, which is true of almost everything we talked about in this book. First, they come up with something, and it's not good, and then they patch it a little bit, so it's pretty good, and then they get it becomes the standard, and everybody sticks with it even when better things appear, as long as it's not totally broken. All right, and so... Uh, Here's things that can go wrong. If you just use the shared secret as an uh, encryption key and put it as your key for AES or something, that would sound good, but it's not good because if you think about P, unless P is two to the N minus one, then the first bit is more likely to be zero than one because you don't really go up to the largest possible value. That's all ones. And that means you have a failure to be white, white noise. There's one bit that is more likely to be one value than another. And that means there are patterns in the output and patterns can be used to deduce the key. So you really should use a key derivation function to scramble the, the shared secret into something that is white, that has a 50% chance of every bit being zero or one. There are legacy protocols out there. Um, there I've looked online to find the names of these things. I looked in Wireshark, I could not find them in my modern browsers. I don't think they're commonly found, but apparently they're pretty common if you install OpenSSH in some of the old and some default values allow these. Here's some of the names, Diffie-Hellman Anonymous. You see it shows up as ADH, Anonymous Diffie-Hellman, or DH underscore Anon is the name of this in various systems. And this is one of the protocols, um, which I don't see anymore, but I would imagine if you do something like load IE3 or something, or Windows 95, you might see this. And there are certain old servers that still hand out this stuff and certain old softwares that still hand out this stuff and misconfigured versions of software that, um, that's the one I saw some blogs about. There are some legacy settings of OpenSSL. If you just turn on some kind of default suite, it just turns on everything, including this old stuff. And then you could downgrade to this and be using the unauthenticated. Yeah, you could. But as far as I can tell, modern, when I did a TLS set connection to servers these days, it doesn't offer any of these. I think it would only offer these if you had a really old browser and you connected to a really out-of-date server. That's what's supposed to happen. Like if you load IE3 and you connect to a modern server and there's no protocol that it will accept, it's supposed to just pop up an error message to say, I cannot be set up a TLS session. I've never seen that, but it'd be fun to try like in a virtual machine. Yeah. I guess if you loaded Windows 95 in a virtual machine and <laughs> loaded up IE3 and connected to Google, that might happen. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I think I have some old XP. I have some old Windows 2000 disks in my. You can download Windows 2000 XP now from Microsoft Defended Support. So oh, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that could be good. Yeah. And you could also get some really old version of Linux. I'm sure that would be fine. And some old version yeah. of Linux would have some old version of Firefox, and you could probably do it. Anyway, so uh, another thing you can do is use unsafe primes. If you don't use the safe primes, now there are some versions of Diffie-Hellman that did not bother finding these safe primes, because as you can see, it's not cheap and easy to make a safe prime, and I think originally people didn't take the threat too seriously. And it turned out, uh, even in up to 2016, there were unsafe primes in use, and there was an attack based on that, where you would choose parameters that caused people to get stuck in a short loop, and now the key is drawn out of a small group of um, of possibilities and you can get, you can get it. So that was, uh, it has actually happened as recently as a couple of years ago. All right, and I've got some cahoots. If I can get my cahoot going, there we go. All right, and there we are, 141, okay. Good. All right. There's a possibility of eight Cahooters. We'll see how many we get. Whoa, okay. This must be, uh, that looks, Caitlin has an evil grin. That's Caitlin. Well, she did this before and it seemed all right. Up to 2000 seemed to be fine. Because none of them get ready right answers, so I. Well, you know, it seems it seems like you could totally make one that just answers every possibility quickly yeah. on one of these accounts. And if you have uh, n questions and two to the n accounts, one of them will get them all right every time and get the maximum number of points. That would seem that would seem like a way to do it, right? And if I only have four questions then you only need two of the four. Just 16 accounts would be enough to be... Wait, would it be 16, 256? 256, right? Yeah, 256 accounts would be enough that one of them... So I mean, that, that would be doable. I'm not, I'm not. But that would... I'd give her the points. That would be cool. Yeah, right. You can... Yeah, anyway. I think we'll go. I'm assuming the real players are in this mess somewhere. All right, so, all right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So what should you use for modules in Diffie Hellman? Six answers. Six people. Yeah, she did. She only programmed things that made a lot of counts. She didn't actually make it do every possible answer. So that's right. Here, last like last time, her attack is really not that dangerous. Anyway, safe prime is the right answer. All right. So which of these is the fast attack on Debbie Helm? Not that it's very fast. It is the fastest attack. What's that? Like the other attack? It seems like it would just be like a, a Python scripting challenge to make it answer. So uh, the number shift is the fastest attack. All right. What property mitigates against man in the middle attacks? All right, that's authentication, of course, then because the person in the middle cannot authenticate as either party. All right, what system is most secure but not used much? Yeah. <laughs> 3G, yeah, that's <laughs> People are arguing greatly about 5G because in order to be, go to 5G, we'd have to use Huawei. Oh, yeah. That's what they're saying. Chinese is the only people making equipment. Their claim 
that we have to claim they're the only people that are ready to pump out 5G now and everyone is behind. I don't know if it's true. Oh, Huawei claims it's real and they've got it. I don't know what other people claim, but they've all been pretty fake about this. Anyway, these look suspiciously like real people instead of those bots. <laughs> or perhaps uh, an insufficiently determined hacker. <laughs> well, I, I think you should make the one that wins. That would be awesome. That would be awesome, yeah. All right, anyway. Um, so I'll, uh, all right, so I guess that's it. I'm going to go upstairs and see if anybody wants help up here in anything. But um, that's a pretty short chapter. I'm not going to start the next stuff. Um, Actually, yeah. yeah. And, and, well, run another cocoon from like another class. That has like four questions. Oh, you got an attack now? Yeah. yeah. You got an attack ready to go? Holy cow. All right, I'm going to run another Kahoot. That's awesome. Okay, let's go. Um, I've got one from uh, uh, here. I've got one from uh, Triton. Here we are. Uh, tri here, Triton. Where is it? There, here's Triton. I ran this one. Okay, there you go. Okay, a Kahoot is ready. Let's see what you can do to this Kahoot. You got one ready to go already? That's awesome. Is it that simple to make it answer every possibility for every question? Oh, okay. So 256 should be enough if you only want to get four questions right. I think this one has eight questions in it, but who cares? We should still see if it's working. I should at least get a lot of answers, right? Yeah, Answering randomly, that would be easy, sure. Random but fast, that would work. That's cool, so 256, and I think a couple of real students have joined. Well, more than 256. Yeah, just, why are there more than 256? Okay. I'll just start, okay. Let's see. So these should answer randomly, and they have a pretty good chance of winning, I guess, yeah? If they're once they're passed. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. 500 answers with only 250 questions. I guess they're still joining. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, all right. Well, I guess you should win now. We'll see. Um, <laughs> well, that looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, so it should just be random, right? You had 160 winners there. So now you should have like. 40, 40, 40 people that won both. Okay. Well, those are pretty cool. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. I think I'll just uh, skip the remaining ones. Let's see how it looks. If I can figure out how to skip them. I can just, yeah, we are going to skip them. Okay, I'm just going to get to the end and see. How it should you should have almost a perfect score on some of these right by chance. I should have chosen a shorter one, but that's all right. Fifty six hundred. Yeah, seven players just hit answer streak. Yeah. Okay. And. Uh, it's nice and fast. Nine hundred answers in just a second. Well, there we go. So, uh, I bet you did, yeah. But surprising, you only have one person at 85, one at seven. So uh, maybe it punishes you greatly. Like the, anyway, that's because I would assume they all have exactly the same pattern of answers. But apparently, it is not calculated from the time it's who's first. Next person is like, oh, anyway. So, so that's good. So now you got a real winning. That's good. Anyway, I'm going to stop the share. Uh, that's that's important in the world of hacking, although not directly cryptography. But I don't know. That's that's statistics and stuff. I'm glad to see it. That's cool. That's a good.